Hello, everybody, and welcome to the final part of the Conspiracy Theory Iceberg. We're finally here at the last curtain call, and I'm wearing the hoodie that I wore over a year ago now uh, to start the first part of this series. And to be honest, I can never imagine that everything that's happened between then and now would come to be. And I'm so blessed, and I'll get all sappy about it at the end, but I just want to say... Thank you for being here, and thank you for sticking with me this long. Now, I'm sure that you're excited to get into these theories as much as I am, and let me tell you, off the bat, they are a doozy. One thing that I want to mention now that I didn't really emphasize enough throughout the rest of this iceberg is that this list isn't strictly conspiracy theories, but you've probably figured that out at this point. The original name of this iceberg whenever it was floating around on the internet a few years ago was the chart of truth. So it's not just conspiracy theories in the way that we think of them, it's fundamental truths or hidden truths about reality. The reason I say that now is because pretty much every single entry spare a few on this final tier all have to do with theories about reality and God and existence and stuff like that. I will also add that a lot of these theories are the most philosophical within the entire iceberg, so if there was ever a time to do your own research where I could be wrong, this would be it. I also want to say, I'm not sure when this video is going to go up, but I am recording this on Christmas Eve, so let me say first and foremost, Merry Christmas. And I am so pumped and excited to get into this, and now I can finally say we've been from the tip of the iceberg all the way to the depths of it, so let's get into some of the weirdest concepts that I've ever read about. But before we get into that, you may be wondering why I've had a change of venue, and that's because of today's sponsor, Galaxy Lamps. And Galaxy Lamps is such a fantastic product that as soon as it came in, my girlfriend stole it from me and made me come to her place to shoot this ad, so now she gets to be the one to tell you about it. So before we turn this on, Kayla, how does the stand work? Take it out from under your shirt. <laughs> it has a three position stand, so you can control if it goes on the wall or on the ceiling. As you can see, the Galaxy Lamp is a fantastic projector that can cast beautiful images onto the wall or ceiling of your choice. And you can control it on your phone. Not only does the Galaxy Lamp have six different settings and cool color options, but you can also do all of the controlling from your phone. And also thanks to the horrors of modern technology. Alexa, Galaxy Lamp on. Stand by. Okay. Ta-da! Oh, there's the stars. <laughs> yes, there's the stars. Or if you like me and hate technology in general, there's a big button on the side that you can just manually press like this and flip through the different color and laser light options. And thanks to the app as well, you're able to set timers, different times for the lamp to turn on or shut off, as well as rotate and whatever else you like. And thanks to Galaxy Lamps, you can get in on this offer today if you go to the link in the description at galaxylamps.co forward slash windagoon to get your order for 15% off. That's galaxylamps.co forward slash windagoon for 15% off, link in the description. Thank you so much to Galaxy Lamps for sponsoring the video. Thank you all so much for watching. It really does mean the most. I hope that you enjoy. Check them out, link in the description, and we are back to the video. We are going to go ahead and get into it, but as always... Thank you for watching. Bank of Souls is a concept that originated from Jewish mysticism, however, it's been adapted into several other religious theories as well. According to the legend of the Bank of Souls, there is a finite amount of souls that can ever exist within human history. Specifically, this pool of souls is known as the Chamber of Guff and exists at the base of the Tree of Life. According to this legend, the tree of life bears fruit, and that fruit is actual human souls. Whenever a child is conceived, Gabriel reaches into the chamber, which is around the base of the tree where the fruit has fallen. He draws out a random soul, and that is passed into the new human that was just created. However, this tree has seasons of plenty and seasons of famine. In other words, there are some times when there are more people in the world than the tree can provide. According to the theory around the Bank of Souls, if someone is born or conceived at the time that there's not a soul for it, it will simply be born as a person without a soul. This is especially true in the modern age when population is at the highest that it's ever been and the tree cannot sustain the amount of people being born. These soulless people, or NPCs as the internet so delicately puts it, 
exist on Earth along with people who do have souls, and as a matter of fact, in some cases, are used specifically to test those who do have souls to judge their worth. In other words, according to the theory, there are some people who exist and simply do not have control of their own actions, so they are purposefully made as a means to judge those who can be judged. You can follow that theory further and say that the reason you're so used to seeing people who have what is to you completely mind-numbing opinions and are constantly at opposition with you is a deliberate choice from whoever is controlling the system as a means to see how you deal with opposition. Position. The theory has several continuing shoots similar to that coming off of it. For example, there is one side of it that says several different cults or quote-unquote satanic rings who perform human sacrifices are just doing it as a means of sending a soul back to the tree for replenishing, as well as other theories that say whenever the tree finally runs out of souls completely, that is the apocalypse and when the world will end. So yeah, soulless people are put on the world simply as morality speech checks. Try not to think about it too much. Incorruptible Saints is a phenomena that has been reported specifically in Roman Catholic and Orthodox churches. According to these religions, several people have been found throughout history whose bodies have been completely untouched by decomposition. Specifically throughout the 14 and 1600s, bodies were exhumed that had been buried for hundreds of years, and whenever they were found, it seemed as if the person was simply sleeping. This has been such a common occurrence that there's actually a rule in Orthodox common law that says a bishop has to show up and affirm that the body is in fact incorruptible. In several of the instances where an incorruptible saint was found, they were placed underneath the altar of churches as it was shown God had favor on that person and hopefully that favor will apply to the church. Also, for those that don't know, to be considered a saint within Orthodox and Catholic tradition, there is a set of requirements that the person has to do, and one of them is to perform a miracle. For a long time, having an incorruptible body was seen as a miracle in itself. So if that person followed the other steps in their life that qualified them for sainthood, and then their body was found to be incorruptible, they were then affirmed as a saint. Between things like this and Saint Padre Pio Stigmata and the Miracle of Lanciano, which are things I'm going to casually mention and maybe talk about in the future, this has been seen as evidence to some as proof of the Christian God. We're now breaking into the first philosophy one, which there's going to be several more of, with the God of the Gaps never existed. Now, it's kind of debated where the phrase God of the Gaps first originated. Nietzsche said in one of his writings, specifically I believe it was in On Priest, that he said whenever there is a gap in human understanding, Christians specifically fill it with God, and that's where God comes from. So according to Nietzsche, God isn't real, and whenever people say there is a God, it's just because humanity can't explain something, and God makes for a good scapegoat. The other place the phrase may have come from is from Henry Drummond, who was an evangelist who also accused the idea of God of the Gaps as being a lazy write-off for understanding. Drummond said that Christians constantly have these gaps in their knowledge that they choose to fill with God and that that was the wrong way of going about it. According to Drummond, God either has to be the God of everything or he just simply doesn't exist. In other words, we can't have God be this spontaneous miracle worker who shows up to fill in things that we can't quite explain and then explain the rest away as natural processes of science. In other words, God is either absolute or he doesn't exist, and that's what God of the Gaps Never Existed is trying to get across. See, the whole God of the Gaps mentality is believed by many to be part of the reason that Christianity and belief itself has declined so much in the last century. In other words, before modern science, there really wasn't a way to explain the world outside of some supernatural entity. But now science is at a near complete point in understanding the world around us, those gaps have gotten smaller. So people who apply God to those gaps have caused God to become smaller. This is why the concept is considered a bad thing by both evangelist and atheist. The reason that it's this low on the iceberg is because it implies that if there is a divine creator or some God above us, then it has to be 100% all-encompassing in every aspect of our lives. 
This is sort of the antithesis to the agnostic point of view. There can't be a God who works some of the time and then everything else is science because if we just apply God to those little miracles, we'll eventually figure out that they're all different rules of the world that we live in. So if we were created, then a creator had to inspire and create every single one of those rules. Meaning that the entire human experience is completely curated, which is either very comforting or very terrifying depending on who you are. Oil and resources from humans is the rather depressing thought that there is a good chance a lot of biofuel comes from humans. Now, while with crude oil, it could take you know, a really long time for the matter of humans to compress into it. It is not a secret that humans go through methogenesis where their body produces methane, which is absolutely a fuel. So the theory saying that perhaps the methane gas that you use to heat your home is an entirely dinosaur fuel and could potentially be one of the 108 billion people who have died on this planet. And of course, some have taken this theory farther to say that perhaps those in power have figured out a quick way to make crude oil and that humans are being farmed as the resource. Feelings auto-suppression relates to a sort of global desensitization that has taken place over the last several decades. So to make it more personal, remember the first time that you saw a scary face pop up on YouTube or in a movie and you were a little kid and it scared you really bad, but then after you saw more and more over and over, you kind of quit caring. And you know how that same thing also happened with human suffering? Like the first time you may have heard about a dangerous attack against a group of people, you were very worried, but then it just became such a common thing, you quit caring. That constant loop of negative emotions can cause you to suppress them whenever they come to the surface, which is a totally natural human response. However, when this response happens across the entire population for years on end, the results can be a little concerning, particularly on the next generations moving forward. In other words, children today are not nearly as worried or concerned about world events as perhaps the generation before them was at their age. Because this constant stream of negativity has served to cause a worldwide auto-suppression of negative emotions. Not only that, but it's been shown that apathy or simply holding in emotions can cause feelings of depression as well as illnesses if gone on for too long. So similar to earlier on the iceberg where I said that things like toxoplasmosis has changed the whole of human history, simply disregarding our basic human emotions has quite potentially changed the course of humanity forever. Adult film stars leeching your energy is the natural conclusion of several things that I've talked about up until this point. Remember the succubus that I talked about way, way back? Essentially these demonic or spiritual entities that want to steal your life force. And I believe it was in the last year I talked about erotic energy that you literally give off whenever you give off those emotions. Well, in the 21st century, what do you think would be the most effective way for those entities to steal that energy from you? That's right, the internet. And according to this, the energy that you feel being drained from you afterwards is quite literally energy that has been drained from you. Earlier in the iceberg, I talked about kundalini energy and how it can be stolen from someone over a distance. While this is saying that perhaps through the digital screen, it has been stolen from thousands, if not millions of people for the past few decades, and no one's the wiser. Virus 23 is kind of the predecessor to things like the despair code. According to various board post, Virus 23 has traced its way all the way back to old Cold War Russian documents, specifically documents that were researching memetic entities. There's this entire theory that's worked its way around the globe for a while around things like shared consciousness and shared stories. I've talked about earlier on this iceberg, and I know I keep saying that, but this is the final tier and it does put the bow on a lot of theories. But I talked earlier about how someone on one side of the planet can develop these spontaneous ideas at the same time that someone on the other side of the planet does as well. Well, this isn't only seen in things like technology, but is also seen in things like theories and ideas and philosophy. And because things like human thought patterns and memory aren't fully understood, there's a belief that this exists in a sort of cloud that encompasses everyone at once. So if this does exist as a sort of shared memory bank, is it possible to transmit a virus through it? Virus 23 works as a self-replicating mental contagion. In other words, once one person is conscious of it, 
that causes them to think of it. It then goes to this sort of cloud of human understanding and is continued to pass down through the line. Some have even said that this virus was originally started by Cicada, which if you'll remember like back in tier two, were the people who hosted that sort of nationwide scavenger hunt. And while some think merely hearing the words virus 23 is enough to transmit the virus, I don't believe that is what the theory is going with. See, with a lot of those documents and the idea of mimetic entities, it particularly is saying that it can be hidden within an unassuming thing. In other words, it could be a story, it could be a character, it could be a phrase or whatever. Some random stories or media or folklore or whatever could exist as these sort of trip minds throughout the human understanding that whenever stepped on could cause, I don't know, paranoia or depression or some negative thing. I mean, I imagine it's not positive. I imagine if you get virus 23, you don't become like an upstanding citizen all of a sudden. What makes this, if it was to be real, more threatening than the despair code is you could at least see the despair code coming, whereas virus 23 could literally be anything. Pancreas denial. Have you ever seen your pancreas? That's what I thought, moving on. I'm just kidding, that's not the theory, but it would be really funny if it was. According to the theory, your pancreas is actually your third chakra and is used to filter things like negative energy. Supposedly, the powers that be that know about the power of the pancreas don't want the common person to have access to the pancreas's true capabilities. So they have done things like store negative energy in our food, in the media we consume, and other nefarious means of anti-pancreas propaganda as a means to stifle the human spirit. And if you've heard of someone getting their pancreas removed, it's simply because their filter was too clogged with all of the negative energy in the world. Patterns manipulation in itself is really broad, but I'm gonna look at a specific avenue of it. Essentially, it's saying that there are patterns that exist within thought and reality as a whole. In other words, everything from how you think to the world you exist in revolves around these certain patterns. Several people who experiment with psychotropic drugs say that while under the influence of them, they begin to see patterns and other designs creep up in the world around them. A lot of this relates back to things like sacred geometry. And human thought patterns are called just that because people tend to think in regards to what they know. In other words, if you are trying to get someone to believe a different truth or the truth you want them to, you begin by starting with things that they already know as fundamental truth and working your way from there because human brains exist in these realm of patterns. If I was to just run up to you and say that Bigfoot's in my backyard, you may say, you're crazy, why are you telling me this, get out of my house. But if I was to approach you and say, you know, there's several species of gorillas that have existed that kind of just disappeared from the biological tree. And every time that we go searching in the forest, we find new species of monkey here and there who are normally in endangered populations. Well, who's to say that one of these species of gorillas didn't get really tall and they just migrated their way north from South America and now one of them's in my backyard. You'll still probably tell me to get out of your house, but what I did is I worked off of something that you know and then changed it from there. Therefore, by manipulating the patterns of your own thought, I got you to a conclusion that you never would have accepted otherwise. The theory is saying that perhaps this same manipulation could exist within reality. Concepts like magic or illusion can be performed in legitimacy if that person can manipulate the patterns reality works within. In a sense, this is similar to a lot of what modern science and chemistry have been able to do in themselves. They have understood how the fundamental world works around them and then manipulated it within its own rules to get it to a place that you would have been executed for in the dark ages. And if I'm able to convince you about Bigfoot, then what could be possible if someone really tapped into the patterns of the world around us? Ascension Blacklist is implying that there are some people who will not be allowed to ascend to the next plane of existence. Think about it this way. If souls do exist as these eternal entities, and if things like reincarnation exist, then who's to say that some can't remember past instances or have a greater understanding of the world around us. 
So obviously these people who may have a higher plane of knowledge than the rest of us could have grudges against people here on Earth. Ascension Blacklist is postulating that perhaps the purpose of secret societies like the Illuminati or insert other creepy shadow government thing is to decide who will and will not be allowed in eternity. Getting into theories like this is fun because there's entire things talking about the NPCs from earlier, how they are used specifically to target the people who have been blacklisted, and that in some cases the people who have been blacklisted can be such a positive influence to those NPCs that they get back on the entry list. But the short of it for this video is saying that secret societies or secret organizations who have a better understanding of the eternity and of the human soul have a say in who is and is not allowed in. Oikiosis, and according to the internet that is how it's pronounced, I looked one up this time, is closely related to ideas of Stoicism. So without getting into hundreds of years of philosophizing, Stoicism is essentially the idea that the purpose of life is a perfection of the human soul. In other words, life itself is a sort of test for how one will be judged in the afterlife. Now, if you're familiar with most religions, this isn't a crazy far out there concept, or at least you've heard of it before. However, oikiosis is where the interesting part comes in. Oikiosis is roughly translated to relation or someone's relationship with something else. Applied to Stoicism, oikiosis is saying that one of the chief concepts of humanity is that humanity's perfection is defined by its interaction with others. So if one is to achieve this quote unquote perfect soul, it has to be through actions of charity and goodness to other people. The reason it's on this iceberg is due to something called Dasein's teachings or Dasein. Dasein is a German concept that was brought up around the 19th century that said oikiosis is falling apart because of humanity's increased isolation. In other words, humans over the years have become more self-centered and self-interested and that has caused the very fabric of their souls to fall apart because they are no longer performing acts of goodness or charity with others because they're more invested in their own devices. A lot of applications of this come down to anti-tech stuff and you know, like iPhone bad. But in short, it's saying that partial if not all of humanity has been doomed because we've quit striving for that human perfection. For soul removal is the idea that every human is born with a soul but it can be taken from you. Not only through things like occult rituals, which those also count, but even things like traumatic events or just simple disbelief can cause pieces of your soul to whittle away over time. This leaves the individual open to attack where negative spirits can come and fill in that place that they left open within their soul, and that's where things like possession come from. Not only that, but this theory says that wayward souls that have been separated from their human host float around as sparse energy and in large enough amounts can achieve forms like that of a ghost or a cryptid. In other words, the reason things like old asylums are so haunted is because so many people have had pieces of their soul chipped away at them in there that those pieces now just wander the area looking for their human host. And the only way to prevent things like negative souls or negative entities from attacking you is to do things like ensure a positive environment and energy for yourself and continue to believe in things because if you don't use that space for your soul, there's a chance that something else will. Real Humans Died Millennia Ago is saying that perhaps the way we currently exist is not humanity's highest form. You know how you hear about things like the pyramid or structures like Atlantis and people always say they had to be the super geniuses to build all of that? Well, it's saying that perhaps while technology has increased over the centuries, human thought has decreased to the degree that us as we function now would be near unrecognizable from our ancestors. How unrecognizable, you may ask? Well, some have pointed to things that I've mentioned earlier in this iceberg, like statues of reptilians in Middle Eastern tombs. Or even old legends of things like elves or mermaids could just be other forms of humanity when we were at a higher function. Or there's even some depictions of these, like, you know, like, really big people who used to be able to make these really cool structures because they were really tall and strong. And I'm going to contain myself now. And I'm not going to say it, so we're just going to move on. 
Artifice Predance relates back to the concept of the Great Cycle that I've mentioned a few times up until now. It points out the weird concept that in the human record, there seems to be these pieces of artificial construction that have shown up before we started using them. Essentially, some formed metals and elements have been found that have led the way for human innovation, but now we have to manufacture, so it's kind of weird that they were there to begin with. Also, remember some of those things I talked about earlier in the iceberg, like how microchips or fuses have been found in ancient pottery? Or the idea like structures like pyramids and aqueducts were seemingly discovered and then forgotten and then rediscovered. This all relates back to the concept of the Great Cycle and says that perhaps the previous people or whatever existed in our stead left behind some pieces either on purpose or accident that were the foundation of our cycle and so on and so forth. Hiring a hitman on yourself um, is something else. This is more of a thought concept than anything else. And while I think it's funny that it's this low on the iceberg, it may be just a little bit misplaced. So it's known that in several religions or spiritual practices, committing self unexist is generally frowned upon. So the hiring a hitman on yourself asks the philosophical question, is it the action or the intent that would condemn somebody? With some stating that hiring a hitman on yourself would be a way to subvert the consequences of the thing that would eventually accomplish. Or if you were ever just bored and wanted to make your life more challenging, you could just do that anyway and then try to survive and it would make your week a lot more interesting. Roman Empire Still Rules the World originally comes from the author Philip K. Dick, which I talked about earlier on this iceberg. A lot of people believe that he was more in tune with the underhanded goings on in the world than most people. And in one of the stories he wrote later in his life, he said that the Roman Empire never collapsed and instead several of its senators went into hiding and became the foundation for modern new world orders or secret societies. In other words, they didn't maintain their population or space, but they did maintain their influence. There's even a book written called Descent that talked about how the Roman Empire went into the caverns of the hollow earth and exists as a quite literal underbelly of the world's government at large. And also, if you wanted to say that, you know, whenever the Roman Empire fell, that's when like the Vatican and the Catholic Church really took off. And I mean, they got a whole lot of influence. So, I mean, you know, fractalization is very closely related to pattern manipulation because fractalization is believed to be the patterns of reality itself. People who experiment with very heavy psychotropic drugs like DMT and LSD say that whenever they're experiencing the high, they begin to see the world or a sort of plane of fractals. In other words, these geometric patterns that separate the world at large into these shapes. Some refer to this plane of existence as hyperreality, and there's some who even believe that this is the true state of being and the human condition is just numb to it. In other words, we exist in a dull state of mind on sort of the first level of our reality and doing things that cause your mind to leave that reality lets you see the world for what it truly is, or at least a different realm that exists around us. I'll be 100% honest with you guys, things like this really interest me, but I'm also very, very dumb to, and it's something in the future that I'm going to research more, well, I mean, not like, I'm not, I'm, I'm not going there, but it's something that I'm going to look into more, because some of the stuff here, as someone who reads about this stuff all the time, really freaks me out, and I mean that in the best way. Paleolithic deep state is another one of those natural conclusions to things mentioned earlier on the iceberg. So remember how I talked about how Neanderthals supposedly didn't die, they just kind of went away and did their own thing for a while? Well, this is saying perhaps they went underground, maybe even literally, and began the structures of the world's government and society as we know it now. Now, according to this, they wouldn't still be in the state we know of them of in the historical record. If Homo sapien adapted, then the Neanderthal would adapt as well. But with things like their disappearance from the historical record, as well as odd cave art that shows these kind of human things existing around humans as we know them, implies to some that maybe they achieved some higher form of being, whether that being an underground deep state like I mentioned earlier as the first New World Order, or maybe as some ascended form of person. Also, while researching this, I saw a theory 
that said Cain is the leader of them, and that he never died, and that he's leading the Neanderthal New World Order, and I had nowhere to add that in, but that is too cool not to, and we're moving on. Depression overriding seems really simple at first, but it's the spiritual implications that put it on this level. If you are depressed or sad or any negative emotion, and you manage to find a way within your head to flip that around into a positive emotion, that may not seem like a lot to you, but if you view things like energy and spiritualism as tangible things, then you just committed a form of spiritual alchemy. This relates to the idea that humans are a much more powerful creature than most of us realize. And if we're so concerned with things like the energy and the spiritual and the extra dimensions around us and everything else, we take for granted the little sort of miracles that we can perform. Things like turning a negative energy into a positive one. And if physical energy, as we understand it in physics, cannot be created or destroyed, then perhaps spiritual energy cannot be created or destroyed either, only converted. And by doing something as wild as converting negative energy, you're exercising a form of supernatural powers. So, if you want to get really out there with all our postulations, take something like Virus 23 or the Solar Plexus Clown Glider or whatever, and imagine those mimetic agents that are meant to harm you, well, if you have the capability to convert that into a positive force, then there's no telling what's possible now, is there? In Corings are referring to the absolutes that exist in human culture. In other words, take all the human cultures that exist around the world who for a long time never had contact with each other. You will always see some absolutes, things like weaponry, religion, language, or things like statues or burial sites or just monuments in general. For whatever reason, it seems like these things are engraved on people as a whole. You could view this as a sort of puzzle. If we're to figure out what our purpose on earth is or what existence means as a whole, then maybe we have the pieces to figure it out and everyone has their own pieces, we just haven't really put it together yet. So let's take that another step forward with all the weird theories we've talked about to this point and think about something like the Great Cycle, which I'm going to keep mentioning because it's really cool. Think about how often things like pyramids supposedly pop up through the cycles or things like human history traveling along the same path. If one was to truly believe in things like reincarnation and the idea that we are being tested over and over again to figure out what we're supposed to do, maybe if someone can throw all of this together, it would break the cycle. Soy grand theory, because I know you've been waiting for the finale of the government sanctioned weaponized femboys, and here it is. Soy grand theory is saying that the soyification of society isn't even reliant on soy. It's solely reliant on the cultural shift caused by it. In other words, the effects of soy has caused permanent damage to the human population that cannot be reversed, and the influence of soy products on humanity will lead to a totalitarian femboy empire. You're welcome. Golden Rules of Nature is related to the five basic golden rules of nature. The idea is for something to survive within nature, it has to have balance, growth, connection, harmonization, and love. Now that sounds weird, but let's break that down. You have to be balanced in the way you live. You can't be one way or the other. And this applies not only to humans, but things in nature as a whole. You have to grow. If you're stagnant for too long, you'll be dead. And you have to be connected to the world around you because isolation also leads to death. You have to harmonize with the world around you because if you take too much or are too violent, that will eventually come back on you. And the love is saying that there has to be a passion or drive because depression is a killer. So that's kind of weird to have that little slice of life knowledge this low on the iceberg. But the implications of it is if the physical realm is representative of the spiritual realm, then perhaps those five rules also apply to the spiritual. If one is not balanced, grown, connected, harmonized, and in love with their spiritual lifestyle, then that leads to a spiritual death. And since things like spiritualism aren't exactly exemplified in the modern age, this is saying that because we're not following those five rules, society as a whole is spiritually dying and will, 
I'm sure lead to something bad in the future because we are not treating spiritual existence in the same way we treat physical existence. We are now down to the final five terms of the conspiracy theory iceberg, and I save these five for a particular reason. I think they're not only some of the biggest overall topics, but it seems like a fitting place to close this iceberg on. God's ego death in research is I think probably the most misinterpreted one on the entire iceberg. Everywhere I looked in research for this, people were hyper-focusing on the ego term. See, ego as it's understood in psychology is the self or it's the idea of oneself. So in that sense, you would think ego death as it's often called within the hero's journey of storytelling would mean the destroying of one's own opinion or perspective. In other words, if you have a character in a story who has very hard set fundamental beliefs and then something happens to them and they change those beliefs, that is considered an ego death. However, what I think this iceberg is getting across because everything else on the iceberg kind of points that direction is the other definition of ego death. An ego death or ego loss is what it's considered in very, very hardcore drug trips whenever someone's soul leaves their person. Or even more specifically, whenever your soul escapes your mind and your concept of thought and existence. In other words, it's separating part of yourself from another part of yourself. Here when it says God's ego death, it's not talking about a change of heart God had, it's talking about God's separation of God himself. Think about it this way. Remember when I was talking about the God of the gaps didn't exist earlier and it got across the notion that everything has to be either the total creation of God or none of it was? Well, if every part of existence is a part of God himself, then that implies that at some point God was just one entity. See, if at one point God was just one being that existed as a perfect form of existence, then anything that he created other than himself had to be a step down. So in this form, God's ego death was a departure from himself into this other existence. It was, in a sense, the death of the one true perfection. Some have even taken this theory as to be the root of fractals themselves. Remember how I mentioned that people who have these crazy experiences say the entire world exists in these patterns, or that things like human thought and reality exist in patterns? Perhaps these broken patterns are the pieces of God separated from one perfect entity into the world around us. We hear of concepts in Christianity like the Trinity of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit and imagine God separating himself into three, and this is extending it to the point that God separated himself into everything. But why would God do that? Why would a singular perfect being stoop himself to the point of humanity in order to create them? And that goes into the next theory, God's last wish. One commonality that is seen across nearly every religion is that in the beginning, in creation, God created humanity in order to have a companion. But it's not exactly a companion if it's just a clone of yourself that's as perfect as you are. So according to this, God's last wish, the thing that he broke himself into infinite pieces for in order to begin creation, was in order to create free will. The one thing that God ruled as being better than divinity was the existence of choice. And again, in nearly every religion, the core idea is that humanity separated themselves from God because of a selfish choice. And it's the concept that in the end, humanity exists as pieces of God who have done whatever they've wanted to with that free will. And according to that, because we finally get a happy theory on this iceberg, Every single person is a piece of the perfect God who has been given the opportunity in their life to demonstrate how they will use that perfect soul to do whatever choices they wish. And the reason this is such a big deal and so low on the iceberg is because it implies that humanity does in fact have a purpose. And that purpose is a demonstration of the concept of choice in order to eventually return to the companionship with God in divinity. In other words, God's last wish is saying that God destroyed absolute perfection in order to give humanity their own chance. And then finally, we're into the last three entries of the conspiracy theory iceberg, 
and all three of them are very closely related. There is no conspiracy refers to the idea that there is no objective truth that is being hidden from us. It's kind of weird to get all the way to the bottom of the iceberg and then to hear it say that no conspiracy is actually real. But what this is saying is that there is no secret society, there is no hidden power, there is no shadow government, or anything else that has a better grasp of the human condition than we ourselves. See, there's this weird kind of comfort in the idea that there is some grand truth or grand secret of the universe that's just being hidden from us. Because then, if someone else is hiding it from us, that means it's something that we can understand and something that we can put together. But if the truth is in actuality that we're all just as lost as each other and there is no one person in control, that makes the conclusion all the more terrifying. Any hidden order or grasp to maintain power is just someone else exactly like us trying to find purpose in a world that confuses us. In short, there can be no leader if all of us are lost, and in a way, everyone is trying to find their own path. Which leads directly into the next theory, all conspiracies are true. I know it's kind of weird to have one be no conspiracy is real and then all conspiracies are real, but they're talking about two different things. No conspiracy is true is saying that there is no grand conspiracy against you the person, whereas all conspiracies are true is saying that all hidden truths or hidden secrets of the world are interconnected. I've kind of mentioned this before with ideas of the grand unified religious theory or the grand unified conspiracy theory. If you've paid attention up until this point, then you've probably realized there's a lot of concept concepts and ideas that sound really similar to each other, they just have a couple words mixed around. The idea behind this is that every understanding of religion, esoteric nature, karma, chakras, spiritualism, and what have you, are all getting back to the root source. So no, it's not referring to the idea that the earth is both round and flat and a donut and hollow and inside out sadly, but the idea that all of these broad concepts of human nature are branches of the same tree that we're all working our way to the roots of. And concepts like this can be overwhelming. It seems to a lot of people who spend a lot of time in topics like this that the world is this impossible puzzle that is never meant to be understood. This is the same reason that a lot of people who dedicate their lives to religious and supernatural studies end up with a feeling of insignificance. It's hard to try to grasp the concept of everything and to not come out feeling like a nothing. But that's where the final concept of the conspiracy theory iceberg comes in, the final understanding. The final understanding is thought to be the destination of most forms of spiritual practice and meditation. In other words, cultures that have developed ideas of things like nirvana, enlightenment, ascension, or what have you, all come back to one core idea. And sadly, I can't just say some magical phrase that will automatically make you achieve a higher plane of existence, at least not yet. However, there is one idea that permeates whenever you're looking at things like conspiracy theories or hidden secrets of the world that keeps coming back as a constant. And that is the idea that your perspective is with purpose. Think about all the crazy stuff I've talked about that has to do with metaphysics and magic and geometry, and esoteric religion, and theoretical science, and what have you. A lot of these concepts can seem so big that they swallow up the concept of the individual. And while, yeah, some of these theories are bigger than the scope of one person, there is no theory that is beyond the reach of one person. In other words, if you're trying to achieve a higher plane of meditation, or a deeper grasp of conceptual science that isn't real yet, or an understanding of ultra realities, or learning about the lost gaps in human history, or trying to figure out secret religions that have been covered up for decades, or anything in between. Every single concept is tailor-made for you the individual. And even if in some of them you can't always be an active participant, you are designed to be the one true witness. Whenever talking about things like the human soul and eternity, it's really hard to kind of narrow it down to a place that we can grab it because it seems beyond our reach. When in actuality, if it's some hidden secret or supernatural knowledge we want to learn about, we have the key. The best way I heard this described is that everything is you and everything is me. Because in the entirety of human thought, there has never been one concept, theory, or idea that was made by humanity in the absence of humanity. In other words, 
Don't spend your life worrying that you're missing out on something greater than yourself, because according to the final understanding, you're right where you're supposed to be. And with that, we have the end of the conspiracy theory iceberg. While I was researching uh, the final understanding, I normally do like word searches or phrase searches to see where they pop up online. And I found a Reddit post from 11 months ago where someone was asking about the final understanding and a guy replied and said, I don't know, but there's this YouTuber Windagoon who is currently doing a series on it. He just got done with the first episode, but one day he'll get there. So make sure you're watching when he does. And now, here I am, and I made it, and we all made it. And whenever I started, I never thought that I would get this far, yet here we are. And I just want to say to the guy who said that, and to everyone who was watching in the beginning, and everyone who picked up along the way, and to everyone who's here now, thank you for watching. I am absolutely bewildered about everything that's happened over the course of this year. Whenever I started the first episode of this series, I had, I think, 900 subscribers, maybe a thousand. It was close. Um, maybe eight or 900. But either way, in 21 episodes of this series, I am now setting at around 911,000 subscribers. Um, and like, at first, whenever I made the first couple videos and there was some traction, I was so excited. I'm like, all right, I can make this conspiracy theory iceberg and people will watch. That's so exciting. And then I said, well, maybe I can make other iceberg videos and people watch that. And I said, maybe I can make other creepy content. And that just kept snowballing to now. I feel like I have the opportunity to talk about whatever I want to talk about and tell whatever stories I want to get across. And it feel, I, I know I'm, I don't want to sound like I'm taking it for granted or I expect it to be there. But it feels like because of the support I've seen so far that someone will be watching. And as someone who's just wanted to be a storyteller and now has that opportunity to do so, that is one of the most encouraging things that's ever happened to me. And this series really has been a life-changing experience because of it. And to see all of you who were so supportive throughout this entire thing, you were there at the beginning and now you get to be here at the end and... I hope that in whatever sense I've done right by you, because that, like I said, this was just like an interest of mine. It was a cool little hobby and being able to bring that to you guys in the capacity that I have, I hope that I made your time worth it in whatever regard. And I really, it sounds like I'm leaving YouTube. I'm not, <laughs> but the series is over. And I saw a lot of people who are really sad that it's ending, and I totally understand. The series has been really fun. It's a really cool way to kind of shotgun style present all these different crazy out there ideas. Um, however, I, I'm also a little bit sad that it's ending, mostly for nostalgia's sake, since this was what began my channel. Um, however, that sadness is immediately overwhelmed by how excited I am for what I have planned in the future. Uh, one thing I want to note now, and I want to say before I get into the rest of it, is right now I just ordered professional camera equipment finally. I know it's been a year, right? For those that don't know, the entire Conspiracy Theory Iceberg series has been recorded on my iPhone. You're watching on my phone right now. And one of the reasons that I waited until now to order equipment is as a testament for whoever comes in the future to say that it's not the equipment, you don't have to wait forever to get everything perfectly in line, you can just turn on a camera and start talking. Uh, but now that I have proven that silly little point of mine, I'm going to get actual equipment. <laughs> um, I didn't just get the camera to make the videos look better. And I don't want to go into detail about it now because I don't want to overhype something. Um, but I have so many plans for the future and that's the reason i'm not really sad right now i'm more excited than anything because now i finished the first series i started on my channel i put the bow on it i love that the final understanding was the last term it was like the optimistic finality to the whole thing and now that that's done i can dive into super long videos about some of these topics if you catch my drift uh to talk about these grander ideas of humanity itself i can really dive into some of them and like I mentioned with the better camera equipment, 
What I'll say for now is not every video is going to be shot sitting in this chair in this corner. Some of them will be, of course, but I have plans to step forward, if you know what I mean. Like, just as my channel stepped away from just the Conspiracy Theory Iceberg series into everything else, I want to keep expanding and I want to keep getting bigger. Um, because you guys have given me the opportunity to grow and to talk about things that interest me. And it, it really is wild that a year ago I didn't know what I want to do for the foreseeable future. And then you guys were just a blessing that showed up and dropped this in my lap and said, here you go, have fun with it. Um, and it really, it really is overwhelming. And now we're here at the end of it. And I I'm getting sappy, but just above all else, thank you for watching. Um, thank you so much to my subscribers, as I mentioned. Thank you so much to my top tier patrons. As you can see here, thank you to all of my patrons. I was looking at the first few videos of the uh, Conspiracy Theory Iceberg series. And whenever this series started, there was like uh, six people. And the first of which being my girlfriend. Thank you, Kayla. Always supported me. Um, but it was just six people and then seven people then eight people. And I would read them out of a notebook at the end. And to go from that to all of this, uh, just constant love and like you. Oh, I really wish I could share the feeling with all of you of wanting to do something and having such an overwhelming abundance of support in that thing to the point where it doesn't become a question of if I can, it's how far can I go with it. And you, you guys have just been, I'm getting sappy, but you guys have been fantastic. And I really, I, I say this all the time and I know every YouTuber says it, but I really mean it. Thank you for watching because you don't understand how much you just watching this channel not only allows me to continue to make more content, but it fulfills me in a way I can't really describe. So thank you for that. Um, let me get off the sappy stuff now. So this, you're, some of you are currently watching the entirety of, of the conspiracy theory iceberg in one video because for those who are watching this as it's posted as the last one like i mentioned earlier i'm going to be taking the entire iceberg and throwing it into one video taking out the intros and the outros i'm also going to go through and fix some audio issues as well as some editing mistakes so it's not going to be just exact it's going to have some um fixes in the middle it's going to have less mid-roll stuff like that so that's a lot quicker to watch the whole thing through. And I'm going to leave this outro as the finale to the entire series. Um, so if you're interested, stay tuned for that. Or if you're currently watching that and you made it this far, wow. Congratulations to you. You've supported me in a way I didn't even think possible. If you would have told me starting this channel, I'd have a video however long this video is going to be. And that someone would get this far into it. I would have thought you're crazy. And you're still crazy and I'm still crazy but I'm happy that we're both crazy together. Um, so I've got a lot planned for the future. Completely understandable to be sad it's over, but the rest of it's just beginning. So hopefully if you stayed with me this far, you'll stay with me for the next steps of whatever comes in the future. But for now, I believe that should do it. So thank you for watching. I hope that you enjoyed. And I will see you in the next one. Bye. Jay!